Yeah, I feel like just going for the kill out of the opening. So let's go E4. Ooh, Scandi. Okay, Scandi. That's fine. We can live with the Scandi. Man, man, man. Hey guys, just doing a Scandi speed run. Team Scandi guys, let's just get flag on move four. All right, guys. Yeah, so we start with the move knight c3. Now, I've taught, okay, taught you. I've, I've shown a line during the original speed run. I don't know if anybody remembers this line. There's a particular setup here that I think is quite promising and incredibly effective, I think, against players in this rating range. I can see that people aren't really remembering it, which is okay. Oh, no, uh, Not Afraid 90 remembers it, and that's the move G3. Now, it looks pretty lame. It's like Fienkettoing the bishop here might not seem like, you know, th this this isn't how you slay the Medusa. But it's actually, you know, if you give this setup a chance, you'll see that it can get very dangerous for black. And there's a very specific idea that this is associated with, which can be hard to face if black is not accurate. So we start by Fienkettoing the bishop, okay? We start by Fienkettoing the bishop. And... Eventually, black is going to play the move c7, c6, which is very typical for the Scandi, kind of creating an, a little fold for the queen on c7. Now, the knight can go either to f3 or to e2. It depends on how black plays. I can't tell you exactly where our knight on g1 is going to go, which of these two squares. Our pawn is actually going to go on d3, which is rare for Scandi setups, obviously. Most of the time, you play d2, d4. But this particular setup works best with a more modest control over the center with the move d3. And this is all leading up to a particular idea, which uh, I won't reveal just yet, but um, but I will ultimately show you, hopefully, if this happens. Okay. I think this guy is asking me if this is an official speedrun account. I said yes. Okay, he said, I don't care. I said, you'll get refunded. He said, I don't care about the rating. Okay, anyways, but it, it says it says in my notes that this is the official speedrun account. I'm, I'm not trying to con anybody. Okay, so back to the game, Bishop G4. Game abandoned. Okay, where should we put our knight? Where should we put our knight? To me, it makes a lot more sense to put it on E2, actually, than on F3. The drawback of putting it on F3 is that you're blocking the bishop, right? Why did we fianchetto the bishop only to sort of block it with the knight? Now, there are some positions where knight f3 is good, but here I feel like knight e2 is more congruent with this setup to keep this bishop firing on all cylinders. Okay, c6. Now, it's a great idea in such positions to throw in the move h3. Now, h3 is kind of a no-brainer move that you can throw in really without calculating or without really knowing what you're going to do next. Why is it a good idea to throw it in? Because it opens up the potential of going g4. Now, are we going to go g4? Not yet. We're definitely not going to do it now. We don't want to weaken our king side like this. But it's good to have that possibility. In case we need to unpin our knight on short notice, we have this in our pocket. Okay, so now we need to complete our development. Right? So we need to play d3. We need a castle. It doesn't matter what order we do that in. We can castle first. We can castle first, then we can play d3, and then we will be essentially ready to execute the main plan of the setup. So let's go d3, right? Open up our bishop. Hopefully everything we're doing so far is making sense. Okay, well this actually, not only does this still allow us to carry out our plan, but this makes it five times stronger. Castling along in these positions is not dumb. I mean, it's an idea, but it's generally very, very risky. Now, it, it also changes things a little bit because if Black had castled kingside, uh, those of you who've seen the setup before will know that the idea I've been hinting at is essentially just preparing b4, b5 and creating pressure down the long diagonal. Now, of course, b4, b5 is not only the right idea, but it's an idea that could lead to a very quick checkmate. And the question we should ask ourselves is whether we can play the move b4 immediately. Do we even need to prepare it? Because if black takes on b4, we open up the b file, and the b file is 
goes straight to Black's King. It goes straight to the B7 pawn. So to me, B4 is also almost a no-brainer. I mean, worrying about Queen takes B4 is foolish. So Black immediately goes back to C7. Thank you, Min, for the raid. And now we can continue attacking with B5. C5. Now there are several very interesting ideas. I think what most of you are probably thinking about is like A4, A5, right? A4, A5, and then B6. Yeah, and I like A4. I don't see anything wrong with just pushing that A, that a pawn up the board. Okay, B6 it creates a hook and exacerbates the situation even further. What should we do now? Should we still play A5 or should we do something else? We should absolutely play A5. And I'll talk a little bit about how I know that these moves are good afterward. I mean, how am I playing this automatically? But the bottom line is that we're trying to open up the Black King as much as possible. We're trying to create as many weaknesses in the pawn structure around Black's King as we can, which will make it a lot easier once our pieces actually get involved. Now, should we take on B6? We don't have to rush with that. We, we certainly don't have to rush with A takes B6. In fact, I like the idea of developing our bishop to F4 first in order to, in order to connect the rooks. So let's start with bishop F4. And there's a funny trick here. If black plays bishop D6 here, which is very, which is very uh, tempting, and this is exactly what happens, we have a little idea here. So what do we do and in what order? Well, there's two... Uh, actions that we can take and we need to figure out the move order, right? We can take on b6 and we can take on d6. Let's compare. So if we take on b6, black can take with a knight. And then if we take on d6, black can take with the rook and keep the a7 pawn defended. Doing things in the other move order makes a lot more sense because after we take on b6 and on, on d6 and on b6, black is in huge trouble. Either he has to open up the a file for us, which is deadly, or he would have had to take with the queen, which allows the move rook a1 to a6. And then we double on the a file with queen a1. Hopefully that explanation makes sense. Now we just take the pawn. And our queen is going to join in the attack via a1, most likely. This is already devastating. Totally devastating. Okay. This is an instructive moment. Who can suggest a continuation here and there are obviously multiple good moves here i mean in such positions there's usually two or three options but there's one thing i like a lot more than the other moves so i think most of you guys are thinking about queen a1 right which is which makes sense but there's this concept yasser introduced to me which is can be stated as uh the queen as the supporting actress in in attacks that's how yasser refers to it i wrote an article for chess.com that's called that and what it basically says is that people, when they're attacking, have a tendency to involve the queen first, right? You you use the queen as the main attacker, but that's actually the opposite of what should be. And the queen should be, you know, the Napoleon. It should be the war general dictating things from behind. And the problem, if you play queen a1, is that black takes on a7, and then black moves the queen back to c7. And do, do you see the problem? We don't want a queen trade, and so your queen actually becomes a liability if it's not if it doesn't have a supporting cast we need a supporting cast we need to keep this rook alive and so we need to bring it back to a6 not only do we keep it alive that rook is also doing something it's pinning the knight creating the threat of knight c3 to a4 which essentially just wins material the other very important rule to not forget about when you're attacking is don't just have a one track mind and focus on checkmate Winning material when you're attacking is perfectly uh, satisfactory as well. So we want to be able to play queen a1. Can we play queen a1? We absolutely can. But queen a1 might run into knight d5 to b4. So knight b4 is, is a pretty annoying idea. Let's get rid of that knight. Now, are we ready to play queen a1? Or should we throw something in first? Are we ready to play queen a1? Or do we need to insert something? We're not ready to do it. And... Somebody thought to play g4. Somebody thought to play g4. Sorry, somebody thought to play h3. <laughs> somebody thought to play h3, and, and this comes in handy because now we unpin ourselves at a moment's notice. The attack is coming from all sides. And when you're attacking and your opponent is thinking, it's a good idea to spend your opponent's turn coming up with general attacking ideas. Like, what are going to be the next steps in the attack? 
And the way that you do that is you identify pieces that are not playing to their full potential, and you try to see where, how they can join the attack. Well, the queen can join the attack from a5. The knight from e2 can jump to c3. I love that move. Knight c3, let's play it now. Queen as the supporting actress. Look at where it's located. It's on a1. What is it doing? It's supporting the knight. It's supporting the rook. It's ready to jump into a5 when necessary, but we're not rushing with that move. We're using the other pieces to clear, you know, using, using them as machetes to sort of clear the path through the forest, and the queen will come in when we're ready for it. That's the sort of philosophy behind that. Yeah, knight takes d5 is obviously the threat because we're pinning the knight on b6. In fact, black cannot defend against that move. Black is busted. Forget about g7. Who gives a, who gives a about that pawn? Yeah, I mean, black can play queen d8. All, yeah, queen d8 is possible, but then we can already start thinking about sacrifices. Like knight takes d5 anyway could be possible. We could also then play queen a5. I mean, there's a gazillion possibilities there. We could also, oh, I know what we'll do if he plays queen d8. I know exactly what we'll do, and this is a move that really requires sort of advanced attacking skills in order to be able to play. And yet, I think if you understand the concept, anybody can play. Well, obviously now we just play knight takes d5, we win a bunch of material. And like I said, now, if there is a pawn that you can take and it's not out of your way, then by all means, take that pawn, right? It's not out of our way to take the d5 pawn. Does that make sense? Why not? But g7 was out of our way. That would involve, you know, driving two hours out of our way, uh, you know, to some obscure burger joint, you know, which has mediocre burgers rather than just, you know, stopping by the freeway and taking d5. I don't know where that came from. What should we do now? What is the fastest path to victory here? And again, don't look for hero plays, just look for checkmates and look for the most straightforward continuation. We just take b6. What does that do? That allows the rook from a6 to move to a8, driving the king up to c7. And guess what the final move of the attack is? It's a move of the queen. That's what I mean. We didn't move the queen from a1 this entire time. We're only going to do it when we're ready to do it. And I know this is not a particularly special attack or anything, but there are some instructive ideas that remain behind the scenes. No, but castling long there is just, this is a good example of what happens when you castle long in these types of positions. Okay, queen b6, maybe even the most resilient option actually, but it, we do the same thing. We take b6, now we give a check on a8, now we drop the queen back to a7 and we win the rook and we win the game. Queen is the supporting actress. I have a good similar game that I won many years ago that proceeded in a kind of similar, with a similar arc. Castling queenside is just very dangerous in general, like the vast majority of the time <laughs> in any position. You just gotta be very careful when you do that. Okay, so it's over. Our opponent is still thinking, but we're expecting resignation. You get chills watching this live. <laughs> yes. Tilburg, 1994, and now resignation. Okay. So let's let's unpack some of what happened in this game. So this setup with G3, if you check it on the computer, you're not going to find that the engine is particularly enthralled to this, but I, it, it's brought me a lot of success. And it's brought students... A lot of success. So bishop g2, bishop, bishop g4 is fine. That's, that's a completely viable move. c6, h3, bishop h5. I still see a bunch of games in the database. Now, the funny thing is I did miss an opportunity here to play the immediate b4. And by the way, you can search Scandi in Scandi speedrun and you'll find the other game in this line. Queen b4, the idea is rook b1 and you win the pawn back with interest, ruining black's queen side. So... The immediate before was also possible. I see five games in the database, queen c7. Three of them continued rook b1, and white is now ready to play b5, trying to open up the bishop, and this is this line at its best. So just something to file away into your mental directory. You don't always have to prepare b4. You can play it immediately. And this is also true um, of many openings, right? 
you don't automatically always have to prepare stuff. Sometimes you can remove the middleman. So we castled, that's fine. We went d3, I still see two games in the database here, both of which continued e6. And now we would have played a3, now we would have prepared b4. Bishop e7. Now, can we play b4 yet? No, we cannot, because b4 runs into bishop takes b4. I hope everyone's aware of this type of tactic. So in order to be able to play b4, we would have to develop our bishop. We can develop it to e3, for example. And roughly the line goes castles. Thank you, the Mad King. Drift for the prime b4. And the point is, like, you push this pawn down to b5, and this can get quite unpleasant for black. Because if black plays c5, it opens up the diagonal for the bishop, and we can basically play exactly the same way that we played in the game. In the game, black had the king on c8, but this is still very strong, even though there's no king on the queen side. The idea of pushing the pawn up to a6, hopefully everybody can see that that can get quite unpleasant for black. So, in this line, white contends for a small but stable advantage. And so I, I really like it. It's very simple. And I wouldn't recommend just going out and playing it. I would recommend that you do your own research. Uh, but, but that you use these speedrun games as kind of a basis. If you need a line against the Scandi, that's practical and not very theoretical. There are several of those lines. This is one of them. So, castles, right? And b4, to be completely honest, is, is a no-brainer. I can give you at least two or three examples from my career where I did something very similar. And usually you don't even calculate such moves that carefully because I think what, what a lot of people don't understand is that in the grand scheme of things in a middle game, sacrificing a pawn is not a big deal, period. It's, it's only a big deal if you're approaching the end game. Then it is a big deal, right? If there is a risk of simplification in a pawn end game, being down a pawn is often equivalent to just losing on the spot. But in a middle game, your risk is essentially quite minimal. And, and you know, here's one example of a game where I, I made a very similar move taking, you know, only two or three minutes just to check the basics, but I didn't really, you know, put in too much thought because it, because it really isn't that much of a risk. Yeah, so this is a game that I played against. Actually, a pretty strong player who very uncharacteristically made a terrible mistake here. So black is already better. I have the two bishops. It's a nice position. But my opponent castled. Queenside. And... Well, if you look at this from a, a technical point, point of view, you'll see that white is attacking the pawn on f5, right? One, two attackers, and one, two defenders. So e takes f5 is a threat. I think a lot of people would automatically play f4 in this position, or, or maybe f takes e4. But what did I play after about two or three minutes of thought? And, and this, I'm not showing this to show you that I'm such a remarkable attacker. This is actually just a very typical attacking move. Yeah, just go b5. And yeah, my opponent, oh, well, taking on b5 is just immediately losing. Trade, trade, and rook b8. And, and white just loses the game because you're going to take b2 after the bishop moves. And if the bishop doesn't move, you're going to force it to move with a6. So my opponent took on f5. Yeah, black is a pawn down. But, but just look at this. c4, a5... Now I just moved my queen out of the x-ray, and now b4. I mean, this is this is over. Right? Knight b1, knight b5, sacrificing another pawn on the c4 in order to open up uh, the, the c-file. In order to open up the c-file, now I put a rook there, and my opponent resigned in this position. I mean, look at, this is the final position of the game. <laughs> Black is down two pawns, but knight b3 is coming, followed by queen takes b2 checkmate. So... This is, I'm, I'm less trying to kind of explain the details of the attack and more give you the bigger picture of the fact that moves like b5 should often be played. I don't advocate for anything to be played automatically, but you're really not risking that much when you sacrifice one pawn for a clearly strong long-term attack that may or may not work, but you know for a fact it'll bring you good practical chances. Well, F4 and dark squares or the direct attack, how to decide? Well, well, that's what I'm explaining. I, the, the direct attack, to me, looks like a no-brainer. Just because I, what I'm seeing is that these pawns are so overwhelming. The other observation is that white doesn't have a dark squared bishop, which means anything that happens on the dark squares is going to be devastating. And a lot of the attack basically proceeded on the dark squares. 
So, it, it, you know, if you just understand that C4, A5, B4 is coming and there's nothing I can do about it, then B5 becomes a lot more appealing than F4. Um, now, is there an algorithm for always deciding this? Do you never save your material? Obviously not. But, but if you are an attacking player with attacking tendencies, the point I'm trying to make is that you should usually err on the side of, of sacrificing stuff as opposed to not sacrificing it. Here's another example, just to hammer this point in, where I sacrifice two pawns, and still neither of these sacrifices, you know, I, I, I didn't I wasn't too broken up over either of the, the pawns that I sacrifice in this game that I'm about to display. Um because I understood that even if a computer could defend, the, the long-term practical potential was tremendous. Okay, so this was a King's Indian game, by the way. World World Youth Under 14. Um, so this was the same-ish. Uh, I, I played the classical variation, blah, blah, blah. Opposite side castling, as you can see. So the first moment came after I played knight h5. And my opponent played g4. What should black do? Yeah, so... If if you go knight back to f6, you you'd get your your hands chopped off in like a Russian chess camp. <laughs> you have to go knight f4. Yeah, th this is just this is a move you play with your eyes closed. And my opponent, to my surprise, so he went knight g2. But and, and this is a slightly trickier moment. I was really happy with what I did here. I was really happy with what I did here. I think a lot of people would say, okay, well now white is threatening to play knight takes f4 and then bishop takes f4 and keep the dark squared bishop so let, let's take the bishop but that's not what i did or let's play g5 and support the knight which is bad because it creates a hook that white can attack it also creates a gaping hole on f5 instead i just played knight d7 i just decided to leave the knight on f4 my opponent couldn't resist he took it but look at what i get i get this massive diagonal for the knight i get a very nice perch for the other knight and, and i'm just coming for him queen f6 b4 knight a4 just the potential is huge queen f6 he took on c5 which is fundamentally the wrong approach giving me a monopoly over the dark squares and now here comes the second sacrifice after b4 knight b1 what consequent sacrifice did i play and this sacrifice is upon two different ways and yet i still didn't really calculate this just freaking do it just open up the queen side. Boom. Pawns are meant to be sacrificed. And my opponent couldn't resist. He went g5. And then he took the second pawn. But now I start playing on the dark squares, right? I build up a little battery. I'm threatening a pin. But the point is not to threaten the pin. The point is to prevent white from ever pushing his center. And now I slowly accumulate, or not so slowly, accumulate the pressure on the queen side. I push my pawn all the way to a3. Forcing b3, and now the devastating idea. Who can find the crushing continuation of the attack? Just understand how you want to arrange your pieces. Yeah, just bishop back to g7, queen e5. And I, I didn't attack in the best possible way. I decided to grab a pawn on g5, and it took me a while before I was able to convert. Um, but, it, it, I mean, it was all very one-sided. I mean, you can see where this is going. And I actually played a pretty nice attack. Yeah, I took another pawn. Now material is equal, I start pushing my my kingside pawns and you know, my opponent resisted for a while, but it was it was always it was always over. Yeah, that was it was a pretty nice game. Um but it, it just illustrates once again that in many cases these sacrifices are just they're so one sided that you really should not worry too much about them. Okay. So back to the speedrun game. I, I got fifth, I think, in, in the under 14 or seventh. I, I did decently, but I was almost the top seed. So our opponent didn't even take before. Had queen takes before occurred, there is one very important subtlety here. The tempting rook b1 is, I believe, a mistake. Why is it a mistake? And some of you are pointing it out. Yeah, so either queen takes e3 or even bishop takes e2, same idea. And you, I mean, the, the, the knight is overloaded and it's attacked. So you have to take the queen and black forces an endgame. 
Now, White is still doing okay in the end game. You know, White still has attacking potential in the end game, but you definitely don't want to trade Queens if you can avoid it. And so here would be a very good uh, spot to play G4, unpinning the Knight so that after, after Bishop G6, you can calmly play Rook B1 and continue attacking. Um, so our opponent didn't didn't go for this line. Can't really blame him. Thank you, Alfred. Not if Jagger Queen C7 P5, and now just a textbook, right? Exactly what I did in in my other game. Just shove this pawn up the board in order to provoke weaknesses. Now, I've talked about this before, and I won't delve into this right now too much, because this is something I could deliver a whole lecture on. What are How are pawns used in attacks? Um, because a lot of people, when you hear the word attack, you often associate it with h4, g4. But what does that mean? Why do we even push our pawns when we're attacking? In my view, there are two main purposes of... Pawns are used in two main ways when you're attacking. The first is essentially to get rid of them to sacrifice your pawns, but not just randomly, in such a way as to create uh, entry points and files and squares for your pieces. So wait, let me show both of these uses here. Let's take a position like this. Situation one would be a move like b6, right? Blasting open. This is what you generally think of when you think of a pawn storm. You think of moves like these. What does b6 accomplish? Well, it accomplishes a few things. First of all, it gives your knight the b5 square. And second of all, it gives you a rook the A file, right? So you've sacrificed the pawn to create entry points. But the second way that you can use pawns is to create anchor points for your pieces. Here, the pawns participate more directly in the attack. And that would be the move A6, which I think is worse in this specific position, but I'm trying to illustrate the point. Um, and I did that in my the game that I just showed, right? You're creating potential entry points where now you can put a queen there and you can use the pawns to anchor your pieces in. So I could show you examples of, of both types. Type one is much more common, but you can actually use pawns as attackers themselves too. You don't just have to dispose of them. But if you're orchestrating a pawn storm, you have to understand whether that pawn storm is actually necessary. And it's not always necessary to push all of your pawns. It's not always necessary to play g4, h4, g5, h5. Sometimes just pushing one pawn down the board is good enough. And uh, just to hammer this point home, I have one more illustration that came to my mind. This is a game that eventually was lost, but nonetheless. So this is a game by Tata Abrahamian, who perhaps some of you have heard of. She's a good friend of mine and uh, obviously a very strong player. She's been playing for a while. So this is a game from 2006, um, US Championship. And Lev Millman is now in finance, but he was a very strong, uh, almost became a GM when he was playing. So in this position, Tatev, she's white. Okay, this is a like super classic Sicilian position, right? And white plays it very classically. She plays G4 and black decides to castle into it. White castles into it. Classic opposite side castling, right? Okay, great. So I think a lot of people here have this misconception where they would just go like h4 and then g5 in no particular order but the way Tatev does it is nice she starts with g5 because this is the move with tempo so it makes sense to play it first now she does play h4 then she takes an opportunity to move the king aside to b1 b4 milman is uh, creating his own pawn storm and now centralizing his knight now f4 and after knight c4, queen moves up, Milman goes a5. So both sides are conducting a pawn storm. But here Tata found a brilliant idea. This didn't work out in the game, but it, I loved the idea itself. Most people would go h5 with the idea of playing g6. The problem with this approach is that even if you play these moves very frequently, black can just sort of take and then go h I'm sure you've seen this kind of thing before. It can be very annoying to deal with this because it's hard to make progress. What does Tatev do instead? How do you circumvent that? She plays g6 immediately. Yeah, and the point is that the, here black just doesn't have time right now uh, to do any of this. Fg, you play h5. And now you don't have to play hg. You can actually shove this pawn down potentially to h6 and now you force the H file open and this gets incredibly dangerous for black. So this is just a much more efficient way of attacking. And if black takes H5, well, obviously we've accomplished our goal 
of opening up both of these files, and now white gets huge attacking chances. Well, if black plays h6 here, then uh, you don't have to play hg, right? You can play like queen g3 or rook g1, and, and you can try to crash through down the g file. So I haven't analyzed this deeply. I remembered this off the top of my head because my coach showed it to me when this game was played. So it, it, take this with a grain of salt. I'm just trying to illustrate a concept. The, the concept is that you shouldn't just blindly push pawns side by side with each other. You should understand what your goal is. And your goal is often to open up as many files as possible. Okay. Uh, after g5, can't black play knight h5 blocking the pawns? Yeah, so knight h5 is a typical idea in such positions. I'm sure it's a move. But often what happens is that white goes like bishop h3, bishop g4. And I can show you other examples where this knight on h5 often gets uh, in, 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 into serious trouble with this bishop h3, bishop g4 idea. And while you can go knight g3 and you can eliminate the bishop, look how many moves you've made. And you've actually done white's bidding for her. I mean... Rooks on f1 and g1 are already nicely positioned. So that was a good question, but uh, hopefully that, that makes some sense. But yeah, in many cases, you do want to use your knight to blockade a pawn storm. Um, and there's so many subtleties when it comes to pawn storms and how to react to them that I could talk about this for hours. But I hope that this was a suitable preface. I just want to discuss one more concept with respect to the speedrun. So we're going to skip through the next part of the game because we played a5. Everything that we did here was incredibly uh, intuitive. Bishop f4. Now we take on d6 first, then we take on b6, right? Not the other way around. Because a, b, there is knight b6. And then black is able to take with a rook and black holds on. So we do it in the other order. Takes, takes. Now if queen takes b6, then we have rook a6, which is incredibly strong. And then queen a1 to follow. What if e5 after bishop f4? Yeah, so I, oh yeah, that, that is a point I want to mention. What What is the purpose of provoking e5? Who can tell me what we gain from provoking e5? And this illustrates the concept that just because you're attacking doesn't mean that positional considerations go out of the window. We gain the d5 square. Now you might be like, I understand that, but there's a knight on f6 who gives a damn. Well, you actually can... Uh, earn domination of this square. If you look carefully, let's say black plays bishop b7, what tool is now at white's disposal? Exactly, you can play g4 and g5. Before you know it, there's a monster sitting on d5 and the game is over. Black is overwhelmed. So when you're attacking, you got to think about, first of all, all parts of the board, right? You can't just, Hess likes to point this out, you can't just in your mind separate the board into this space and this space and feel like they're unrelated stuff that's happening in the center does have a bearing on what's happening on the queen side yes yeah, so of course black can play h6 here but it's the fact that the square is a long-term weakness that's black's problem right black will never be able to move this knight again and you can play a move like f4 and try to get a knight to f4 so that the other knight could go to d5 so this just collapses for black so bishop d6 we trade we take a7 now the game is over but yeah, moves like rook a6 can, can be hard to play. Um, and, and hopefully my explanation was suitable. Um, I want to show one more example of a very similar move, which I played years ago in a game. So I, I, I had a very similar attack, believe it or not. Very eerily similar in 2005. So a while ago. So here it is. Last example, I promise. Okay. So I was 1800. I had this position with an attack. And Black's King is clearly exposed. So it's white to play. And, well, this was in my, my mastering positional chess book, so that's kind of how I remembered it. What move seems to be topical here? What, what needs to be considered for white? It's white to move. And what seems to be wrong with the move rook takes a6? Like, if you're looking at this move, you need to have a response ready to black's next move. Well, knight c3, just move your queen, right? Knight, knight takes c3 is not dangerous. That's not what's worrisome. Well, if you actually, you have to pay attention to, like, any standoff between the queens. This, this is what you have to notice. And, and black plays c5. And it may seem very flimsy, but in fact, white is losing the knight. Like, you cannot move the knight. 
or else you lose your queen and get checkmated. Um, so what did I come up with here? Well, it occurred to me that I might want to sacrifice that knight, but if you sacrifice it, you got to do something. Uh, why, you know, in the time that black is taking the knight, you have to set up the attacks. So now you go queen a1, which is what made me remember this game. And after c takes d4, this, I think, is the important move. So a lot of people here uh, in this position would, I think, be tempted by this check, rook a8 check. Very tempting. King d7, queen a7, just like streaming in. But again, if you don't have a, a sense of where you're going with it, you're, the attack is going to fizzle out. Black goes back to e8, and white's lost a lot of the advantage. The king is a lot safer than it is on c8. So using the concept of the queen as the supporting actress and as the rook as the main leader, you come up with a much better move that I was really, really proud of. Don't let the king get out. What should white do? No, not bishop takes d4. You don't even need that move. You set up essentially a mating net against the king. You play rook a7. Yep, and if black takes e3, there's mate. Check, check, and mate. So black was forced to drop the queen back to c6 to cover the square. And now very calmly bishop takes d4 with uh, unstoppable threats against black's king. Rook e5. Rook a6 was a really nice move. Forcing the queen back to b7. And now rook a8 check and rook a7 skewering, uh, pinning the queen. There's nowhere that black could have gone, actually. And notice that this attack happens without white's queen making a single move until black gave up his queen. Now it's the queen's turn to rampage everything. So, yeah. So so that concept, I think, is, is applied in this game as well. But, but rook a7, you know, these slow moves when you're attacking can be hard to, can be hard to see. But it's not just always about series of checks, right? You have to know what, what your end game is, where you're going with it. Um, and often keeping the king contained can be a better idea than just giving meaningless and random checks to the king. Okay, and with that, I think we can probably call it a day. That was a pretty deep analysis. Hopefully you enjoyed that. The rest of the game after g4 and knight c3 was not particularly interesting. It was just totally crushing we just take d5 and you know the rest was the rest was uh, history so thanks everybody thanks for hanging out have a good start to your week bye